Hi and welcome. My name is Dana Brown. I'm Sojo's Director of Marketing. In this tutorial, we're going to see how to work with the web toolbar using the Web Framework 2.0. As you can see in the example project, we simply added a toolbar control to the by default web page. As you may already know, you can find this control among those available from the library panel. You can add these to the page doing by double clicking on the control or just dragging and dropping it to the desired position. Once done, the control will be shown under the web page hierarchy in the navigator. As you can see, the web toolbar is positioned on the top of the web page, and as it is the case with any control, we can give it a name or set any of its other properties as the indicator type, title, and also its position while it always fills all of the width of the page. So how do we add new items to the toolbar? It's a very simple thing to do. We can do that in the opening event handler, for example, by adding code to create new web toolbar instances, setting its properties as the caption or the icon to use, and adding these instances to the web toolbar itself. Of course, these web toolbar buttons can behave as regular buttons or implementing new menu items like the instances of the web menu item class. Of course, we can also add flexible space buttons in order to better lay out the toolbar. Let's run our example project in order to see how it works already with the buttons added to it. Here we can see our toolbar where every button has its text caption and icon grouped in the left side and right side of the toolbar with a flexible space between these. So these are the button instances you can see in the opening event handler. In order to create a new button, we use the new keyword on the web toolbar button class being in this case a regular button. Then every one of these web toolbar buttons has an icon and caption property we can set, including also the tag property. In fact, the tag property is one that we can use later where, when a button has been clicked by the user. So why do we use the tag property for that instead of the caption property? It's because the caption property is something we could want to localize in the future, so its value could change in function of the language of the client browser, while the tag property value always remains the same. In our example, these are home, map, search, option A, option B, etc. One thing to consider when setting the icon for the button is that you can choose between using PNG images, for example, or SVG files, which are the pre preferable option because they keep the maximum image quality and resolution at any size due to the fact that these are vectorial, vectorial instead of bitmap images and their file, files are also smaller in general. Here you can see how the assigned icon is a web picture instance created from a constant value. Such value is a string added to the SVG icons module whose contents are the image in SVG format. Another facility provided by the Web 2.0 framework is that we can select and use any of the icon images provided by Bootstrap. For example, here we could simply type webpicture.bootstrapicon and give the name of the bootstrap icon as the parameter. In this case, it's house fill. If we run the app now, after this minor change, we will see how the home icon has been substituted with the new one provided by bootstrap. So you have two options when dealing with SVG icons. Use the ones created by yourself or using the ones provided by Bootstrap that you can find under the icons.getbootstrap.com website. Of course, you can still use images in PNG format, but remember that those are not as flexible in resolution and also tend to have a bigger file size when compared with their SVG counterparts. Once we've created the new instances from the web toolbar icon, we only need to use the add item method on the toolbar itself in order to add the button to it. These are always added in the toolbar from left to right. 
We repeat here the same steps in order to create a new button. In this case, it's the one with the map icon. So we assign the icon to it, the caption and the tag, and then it's added to the toolbar using the add item method. And here we can find a variation on the web toolbar button that we can use to add a flexible space to the toolbar, setting for that the style property to the web toolbar button dot button styles dot flexible space value. Once this button is added to the web toolbar, then the following buttons will be aligned to the right side of the toolbar. So the previous two buttons added before the flexible space will be aligned to the right side of the toolbar, while the next ones added after the flexible space will be aligned to the right side of the toolbar. How about adding a button acting as a menu? That's what we will do creating a new web toolbar button instance in the first place. And then we can create a new web menu item instance, following the same schema as we do with the web toolbar button. That is, we can use the constructor method itself to set the caption, then assign an icon and a tag value to it. We can repeat these steps to create as many menu items we want to add to the menu. Here, the menu will have a total of three entries. And then we only need to add these instances created from the web menu item class to the my menu web menu item using for that the add menu item method and providing each instance as the parameter. Then we only need to create a new web toolbar button instance, setting its properties as the icon we want to use, the caption, and the tag values. But setting here the style property for the web toolbar button dot button styles dot menu value. And finally, we just need to set the my menu instance as the value of the menu property for the button itself. Of course, adding the option buttons to the web toolbar. So let's run our app again in order to see how this button is displayed and behaves in the app. Here we can see the first group of two buttons aligned to the left side of the web toolbar, then the flexible space, and the group of two buttons aligned to the right side of the toolbar. One of these is the options button whose style we set as a menu and containing the three menu item instances we added to it. So if we click the button, we can see such options displaying Every one of these has its own icon and text captions. The icons for the menu entries are a little smaller than the ones displayed for the main buttons in the toolbar, but because these are in SVG format, these adjust their size to the expected one without quality loss. And once we have our toolbar in place with all of the desired entries, we can see how we can capture the user selections both when clicking on the main buttons or the options from the menu. So for that, we need to implement two additional event handlers in our toolbar. The first one is menu selected and the second is the pressed event handler. Menu selected will fire when the user selects an object from the menu and the pressed event handler will fire when the user clicks on any of the main buttons in the toolbar. It receives the item parameter as a web toolbar instance, so we simply assign the tag value from the item to the selected toolbar item label in order to see the name of the clicked button. Usually, you will want to include a select case block here, so the logic of your web app can react to the selected button for example, displaying a new web page, dialog, or any other function. The menu selected event handler is the one that will be fired every time the user chooses an option from the menu. It receives an item instance as the web toolbar button and also the hit item as a web menu item instance. As with the pressed event handler, you will probably want to use a select case here in order to identify the button that has been clicked and also the item menu selected by the user. Once again, our example web app will simply put the tag value from the hit item instance to the selected menu item label on the web page, so we know what menu option has been selected for the user of the app. So if we change back to the running web app, we can see that is what we get when we click on any of the toolbar buttons. 
Here, it displays the tag value for the home button, which will be the case for the map or search buttons, while if we select an option from the menu under the options button, then its tag value is the one displayed in the label of the page. It's that simple. Of course, probably you'll want to use the same toolbar in several pages of your app. In that case, instead of adding the web toolbar directly on the web page, you can create a new subclass based on the web toolbar class. So you can add the web toolbar behavior directly on that new subclass. In order to keep the example simple, we only need to add the name of the web page that contains the label control, that is web page one, and the same for the menu selected event handler. Then we only need to change the super value to the name of our own subclass. And that's all. When we run our example app again, we can see how the toolbar still works as expected, but using our subclass based on the web toolbar class. So you can now see how easy it is to convert an instance from the original class to your own subclass in order to customize its behavior and use that same behavior on several pages without writing the same code again and again. I hope you found this tutorial of interest and I invite you to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel in order to get informed about new videos and tutorials. Of course, you'll find more useful information in the Zojo blog.